My name is Craig Pinkney. I'm a criminologist, urban youth specialist, and lecturer at our local university in Birmingham. Why is violence taking place? Why is violence erupting? Why do we see and hear about so many young people within our society engaging in certain types of violence? So what I'm gonna do is just kind of give you an overview, an outline, an idea about why violence essentially is taking place. One of the things about crime, or when we're talking about youth violence in relation to the UK, one of the things that we need to understand is that crime is racialized. That when we talk about crime, we as a society put categories in which individuals that may be involved in certain crimes and what they look like. So for example, think about this or consider this. A terrorist. What does a terrorist look like? What is the characteristics of a terrorist? Now I know that the characteristics that's in your head right now generally is probably going to be an individual that comes from a particular faith or an individual that comes from a particular geographical location in the world. The same thing happens with gangs. That our programming, whether that is via the media, whether that is via news outlets, whether that is via films, documentaries, reinforces an idea or a stereotype that individuals that commit certain types of crimes come from these particular categories. So like with the example of terrorism, what about gangs and knife crime? Again, if I was to say the concept of gangs and knife crime and I was to get you to think about the characteristics of what an individual involved in that type of behaviour would look like, again, I already know that you have been programmed to think that that person or individuals probably look like somebody like me. But when we talk about violence as it relates to gangs and knife crime, one of the things we don't look at is, well, what do groups actually look like? So yes, you may find individuals that are involved or ascribed to groups such as gangs that may be from BME background. But we don't talk about the different categories of gangs and what type of gangs exist. So you've got serious organized criminal groups that might be such as your Albanian, your Turkish, your mafias, your triads that generally are professionally involved in crime, that generally operate in the grey or illegal marketplace. So these are the individuals that bring in tons of cocaine, heroin into the country, individuals that may be involved in the distribu distribution of firearms, the individuals that may be involved in human trafficking. But oftentimes when you hear gang, you don't consider those types of groups. But what you often hear or find out or learn about is young people that predominantly live within the inner city that are involved in certain types of behaviours which is generally what we've been seeing over the last 18 months in this particular country. So let's think about it. The organised criminal groups that are bringing cocaine, heroin, class A substances, firearms into the country. Then let's talk about the correlation between that group and the group that we often hear about. Because the group that we often hear about in relation to the violence are not the individuals in this country bringing in the firearms or bringing in the weapons. And oftentimes the individuals that come from that organised criminal group do not look like the individuals that are oftentimes the main proponents of being involved in certain types of activities. But they're the two groups. I would say there's another group in society that we often also don't really consider your general peer groups, your vulnerable young people, your impressionable young people, your day-to-day -day young people that live within the society. Some go to school, some go to college, some have dropped out of school, some are a little bit naughty, some might have behavioural issues. But they're not necessarily gang members because crime is not integral to their self-definition. And there's a confusion because it's sometimes like, well, what is it? And how is it that these individuals may come from a particular environment, may come from a particular background, but also may engage in certain types of behaviours? So that goes back to my original point. We don't consider what gangs are and understand what gangs are. So I want you to shift 
the conversation or shift the focus for a minute. And let's not talk about gangs so much for a moment. Let's talk about youth violence. Because my concept and my analysis and what I see within the UK is that our young people are becoming more violent. Yes, some of it is in relation to gangs and gang membership, but a lot of it is to do with the way in which young people live in environments and engage with certain types of individuals that also display certain types of behaviours. So what do I mean? Young people are carrying knives. Young people have access to firearms that do not necessarily have to be involved in gang membership. So that means then we live in a society where our youth are becoming more and more violent, more prepared to take arms, whether that is a gun, a firearm, or carrying a knife in order to deal with the beefs that we often hear about or see within a society. So if I think about some of the young people that I've buried this year, they wasn't gang members. They didn't ascribe to a particular gang. They may have been from a group of young people that may have been antisocial from time to time. Some go to school, some went to college, some didn't attend any educational institution. But were they gang members? No, they wasn't. But were they violent? Yes, they were. And I think one of the things that we need to demonstrate or at least make sense of in our society is why our young people are becoming violent. And one of the things that I want to suggest is we talk about things like fear. We live in a society where we hear about violence, we hear about knife crime, we hear about gun crime, we hear London, 120 plus young people have been murdered. We hear about Birmingham, the West Midlands, gun crime capital, 20% increase of knife crime. We see it on the papers, we hear about it. A government report comes out and says the likelihood of a child to be attacked or stabbed or injured critically may be between half three and five o'clock on any day between the Monday and Friday. Now, do you think that young people that grow up in these environments, these communities, and they hear of all of these concepts and ideas and incidents of violence and some of them have witnessed some of that violence that they may not think that the environment that they live in scared because I would if I'm told that the university building that I'm in right now and there's individuals outside that are potentially going to hurt individuals that are walking around the building and individuals that might hurt me I might think of a way in which I might want to protect myself because I'm scared so you have a lot of scenarios in schools, in colleges, or members of the community that talk about young people being caught with knives. And they ask them, why are you carrying a knife? And they say things like, well, I didn't want to get attacked. Or they say it because they're carrying it because of protection. So not all young people carry knives because it's a fashion. Not all young people carry knives because their friend told them to do it. Now all young people carry knives because they're in direct conflict with another group of young people. Those categories exist. But there's also the category of fear, which links to the second point about trauma. We don't ever talk about trauma and the impact of trauma and the impact of sustained trauma that exists within those same environments and them same communities, where again, young people not only hear about it, they don't also witness it, but they hear it in music, they hear it in films, they watch it in films, they watch it in documentaries, they play it on games, and violence becomes normal. Violence is something that is desensitizing to the individual where it's normal. So where do those young people go as an outlet? When they're hurt, when they're upset, when they have flashbacks when they can't sleep, when they lose their appetite, when they want to talk. There's no spaces in the environment. There's people that don't even understand what the trauma is. So therefore you have young people with undiagnosed traumas, sustained traumas, and are acting out 
because they don't understand what is going on with me. So they see a situation and they automatically become hypersensitive and then they react. They see a situation, they hear of a situation and they do something that they didn't necessarily want to do but because they're feeling a particular way based on something that may have happened to a friend, something that they've heard about, something that they've witnessed. And then we as a society blame those same young people and say they're crazy, they're mad. But we don't take the time to think about trauma and fear and the impact on trauma and fear that might have on a young 13, 14, 15 year old young boy. And we're faced with these issues every single day. So you have communities now that are erupting in violence. So this is where social media becomes really important as it relates to fear and trauma. Because young people utilize social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube. And they're also watching the global picture. So a young person from Birmingham knows exactly what's going on in London. A young person from London knows what's going on in Manchester. Someone from Liverpool knows what's going on in Bristol and so on and so forth. But young people in the UK also know what's going on in different countries. So they see violence in America. They witness the violence that takes place in America between gangs, between groups, between the police, the injustice that may come from the police and individuals that get hurt within those processes. So young people are connecting their traumas on social media platforms. Something that we don't often think about or even consider the impact of social media. So you might have a young boy or a young girl that's not engaged in any activities that might sit from the comfort of their homes in isolation on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, observing violence, observing trauma, observing issues that exist within that society and that may cause that individual to have new ideas that may cause that individual to think and shapes the way in which they behave when they navigate their ways through their own communities because they're trying to make sense of a society that seems so violent that puts the blame on young people that live within the society and that just happens on the ground so let's talk about some other things parents Parents, professionals, those that live within the community, community leaders, faith leaders, likewise live in these particular environments and do not understand what's taking place with our young people. So the easy solution is, is you should send them to school. They need an education. They need to be in an intervention that talks about raising the awareness of violence, raising the awareness of gun crime, raising the awareness of what it's going to be like if you involve yourself in criminal activity. And it's all oh, wow, it's brilliant, it sounds good, but that doesn't engage with their fear and trauma. So no matter how good and how impactful the intervention might be in raising the consciousness and the awareness of those young people, how do we remove the trauma? How do we engage with the trauma? Then we have another issue, austerity. Cots and the impact of the cots, youth centres are being shot left, right and centre or have been shot left, right and centre around the country. Youth provisions are being stretched. Mental health services have been stretched. Policing has been stretched. The presence of policing within communities are now being stretched. And all of those resources are lacking and then you have an environment where young people see no opportunity, have no opportunity, have a lack of resources, have a lack of sustained resources in their community. So they give up hope. They don't feel that they've been heard, they've been seen. So they find visibility in the things in which we as a society don't like or don't agree with. So gangs sometimes makes perfect sense if we want to talk about gangs. Because young people join gangs because gangs are like surrogate families. They replace the things in society that we, as a society, fail to give our young people. 
We can't figure out how to ensure young people can make legit money. So this is where the notion of county lines, in my humble opinion, makes perfect sense. So not that young people are just being exploited, but you have young people that are opting to engage in this criminal behavior because they want to make finance. Young people are engaging in criminal activity as it's around selling of drugs, robbery, burglary, extortion, fraud, because they want to make money. We as a society have failed to ensure the safety of our young people, which we've just mentioned, the fear, the trauma, the shame that exists, this idea of not wanting to be disrespected. We don't engage with young people as it relates to their belonging. They want to be loved, they're looking for an identity. They have no identity. And when you look at these basic things, gangs oftentimes come in to establish that. So whether it's a street gang, whether that is a religious or an extreme group that have ideas about a particular thing that entice particular young people to make them think that engaging in that particular behavior is going to enable them to have a better life. So why wouldn't young people sign up to be involved in a organization that's gonna make them get the things that they want, such as food, such as clothing, such as reputation? Why wouldn't, one, why, why wouldn't they join a gang that's gonna give them status, that's going to give them credibility, that's going to give them safety, that's going to give them aspects of love, relationships, and we as a society, again, expect our young people to live within these societies or live within these communities and just somehow get on with it, but do not create the spaces to enable those young people to truly express their feelings. And that's why it looks like their behaviours are so hyper-masculine. So it seems like young people are always in front of the camera or they're always out in the community just wanting to hurt people because they look like savages. But again, we live in a society that tell young people, just get on with it. We live in a society that tell young people, it's fine, you will be fine. But how are they supposed to be fine if they're told that they might get stabbed between half three and five o'clock, Monday to Friday? How are they going to be fine if they're not sure how they're going to get their next meal? How are they going to be fine if they're told that if they don't apply or affiliate to a particular group of people, then the possibility of them being unsafe is paramount. So I'm not justifying the behavior of gangs, but I'm trying to get you to understand the thinking behind young people and why they would join such a group. But one group we don't ever talk about is going back to my original point, is the organized criminal group. Because these are the individuals that either manufacture or bring things like firearms into our country and they disseminate that in the society to young people that might come from the groups that represent that stereotype that we often see within the media. Predominantly white middle class males and their children are Oxford or Cambridge educated and they bring those firearms into the country, disseminate that to young people that might be from BME groups and they use it and we see the individual on the screen 35 years but the individual that brought in the guns and thousands of rounds of ammunition and those individuals get 12 to 16 years. So when we now talk about disparity, disproportionality within the criminal justice system, you start to then understand why people then feel that, why are they being targeted and focused upon, but the individuals that are involved potentially in the bringing of firearms and guns and drugs at a certain level, why is there no attention passed to that? So essentially it's three groups, organized criminal groups that are illegally or professionally involved in criminality that operate very much in their gray market space. And then you've got the individuals that we often see and that we're talking about every single day as the individuals that are involved in gang membership because they're from a particular borough, they're from a particular postcode, a particular area code and involved based on a range of different interpersonal conflicts. And then you've got the vulnerable, the impressionable 
young people that live within our society, live within our communities, that might be inspired by those types of groups and easily can become exploited because they live in environments where there's a lack of opportunity, lack of hope, lack of resources, lack of all of the different things that have been mentioned, then it makes perfect sense why they would join groupings that are deviant and a criminal in its mindset.